Father, we come today to worship you as we study your word. At the end of this lesson study, may we find rest. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Pastor, and thank you, Fountain View Academy, reminding us not to forget the Sabbath. So we're at lesson number 10 in our series, Rest in Christ, and today we're looking at Sabbath rest. Um, I'm hoping that somebody from our congregation is going to be able to read our memory verse for us this morning. Yes, I see a volunteer coming forward. Wonderful. Uh, Brother Fibian, good to see you. If you can just read our memory verse for us this morning, taken from Leviticus 23, verse 3. I'm reading from the New King James Version. Six days shall work be done. But the seventh day is a Sabbath of solemn rest, a holy convocation. You shall do no work on it. It is the Sabbath of the Lord in all your dwellings and the word of the Lord. Amen. Thank you, sir. So last week we looked at the rhythms of rest. And I have to say that opening statement from our guest presenter, uh, Sister Vanessa Kennedy, last week you know, when she just highlighted the importance of the rest in music and how that makes the sound as well. So it's like with the Sabbath, the, the rest completes the week. Powerful, powerful imagery. Um, so the rhythms of rest. This week we continue with the examination of Sabbath rest and why it's needed. Hopefully this week the fact was underscored for you that in God's eternal plan, the Sabbath day is a day of blessing, delight, worship, and service. Now, Pastor Royston, you know, as a minister of the gospel, have you ever felt exhausted when you've come home after a busy Sabbath day? Uh, if so, bearing in mind uh, that Sabbath is a day of rest, does exhaustion mean, exhaustion at the end of, the, uh, of an eventful Sabbath then, does exhaustion mean that maybe there's some conflict in Sabbath rest? <laughs> I, 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 I'll say to you, John, if a pastor after a busy Sabbath day is not exhausted, then he hasn't had a good Sabbath. Um, you kind of look at the life of Christ. I'm kind of mirroring Christ. You know, Sabbath was made for man, not man for the Sabbath. I think some of us misinterpret the understanding of rest. Mm -hmm. You know, some of us think that rest means just to sit down and do nothing. Um, but when you look at the concept of rest in, in relation to Christ and what he did, Christ was always busy on the Sabbath. He was healing. He was, you know, as his custom was, he went into the synagogue on the Sabbath day and he stood up to, to read or to preach. So, um, Sabbath rest doesn't mean sitting down and doing nothing. It means that you're engaged, you're involved in some sort of ministry that doesn't have to do with you. Mm -hmm. Sabbath must be a time when others take focus, must be a time when God takes focus. I'm not saying it must be every Sabbath, but the point I'm making is our, our concept of Sabbath rest is totally, you know, we skew the concept of Sabbath rest, you know? Let me, let me take um, bed, act, sorry, lay activity. I was going to say bed activity. That was going to be a misconstrued. But let me, you know, so you must be involved in outreach. You must be engaged in some sort of evangelistic, um, some sort of charity work, because that's what Christ actually did. And I'm sure Elder John, at the end of every Sabbath, he was exhausted. Mm -hmm. Not physically exhausted, more, but more so exhausted from reaching out and helping and changing lives. Mm -hmm. And that's what the Sabbath in my, in my opinion, and from my understanding of, of Christ's life should, should reflect. Excellent, excellent. Elder John, before you go, can I throw a point in? Go because ahead. last week I made a point online, but I don't think it was read out. about The worms, you know, last week we were talking about, you know, uh, the manna. Yes. If you recognize um, the manna, the worms actually kept the Sabbath. I'm, I just want, <laughs> the Bible says on the Sabbath day, the manna was fresh. But the rest of the week, the manna was eaten. Mm. Even the worms, Elder Johnny, mm. kept Sabbath. Mm. Just a thought I made a note from last week. Fair point, fair point. Thank you very much. So, congregation, 
and viewers and listeners, do you agree with pastor? Does exhaustion at the end of an eventful Sabbath mean there is some kind of conflict with God's plan? Be interested to hear your views. If you're in the church, you can uh, speak from our microphone there. Those of you online, send in your comments in the usual way. So the word remember begins with the prefix re. That indicates going back over something or somewhere again. The Sabbath commandment, as written in Exodus 20, is a reminder of the link between Sabbath and creation. So, Dr. Burton, coming to you first of all, what does Genesis 1, verses 26 through to 27, and Genesis 9, verse 6, say was the blueprint, if you please, for humans? What was the blueprint for humans? If you could just read and expand on that for us, please. Yes, yes. Before I read, just an ironic fact. Um, the hymn, Don't Forget the Sabbath, was written by Fanny Crosby, who was a lifetime Baptist with Wesleyan Leland. Mm. And uh, she wrote that hymn actually about Sunday. Mm. Uh, so that's just an ironic fact there, mm. even as we celebrate that hymn. Um, but uh, Genesis 1, 26 and 27, and Genesis 9, uh, verse 6. Uh, Genesis 1, 26 and 7. Uh, then God said, let us make man in our image according to our likeness. Let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the air, and over the cattle, over all the earth, and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. And 27, so God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him male and female. Um, he created them. And uh, Genesis 9, 6, whoever sheds man's blood, and uh, feel uncomfortable saying man all the time, it means a human. Mm -hmm. uh, by another human, his blood shall be shed. Uh, for the image of God, he made the humans. So um, as we look at the question uh, about uh, the blueprint and uh, prefaced by the comment on remember, I think sometimes we read too much into certain words from an English perspective. And I don't think we need to read too much into the word remember there um, as it relates to history. And I think that that um, shows the tendency sometimes to intellectualize religion, uh, which makes us forget that Sabbath is not a concept. It's not something that we intellectually reflect on, but it's a tangible gift for all of God's creation. And yes, we are created in God's image, uh, but Sabbath is not just for human beings. When we look at the commands, we know it's for the animals too. And in fact, the whole concept of Sabbath we have the seventh day Sabbath, but there is also um, other Sabbaths in the Bible. There are Sabbaths when um, the land rests. Uh, there are also Sabbaths uh, when the uh, people are restored, the things that they've lost um, over the previous 49 years. And so when we look at this whole concept of being created um, in God's image, and I again, I don't want to um, stretch uh, any connection between Sabbath and um, the uh, fact that humans are made in God's image. Uh, but I do believe that those made in God's image um, have a divine responsibility uh, to act as stewards of God's creation. Uh, so those of us who are called to reflect God, those of God who have been made in the image of God, and of course, it doesn't mean that God has a head and two hands and two feet, etc. but basically looking at his image in terms of authority, authority that's been lent to us. And as that relates to the Sabbath, as we see in both Sabbath commandments in Exodus and Deuteronomy, we have a responsibility to um, ensure that not only we uh, receive that rest, seize from our labors, uh, but our land seizes from labor, not every seventh day, but every seventh year, mm -hmm. um, that um, our animals um, seize from labor, etc. And that is our divine responsibility to be stewards of God's will. Amen. Amen. Sabbath rest for all, including animals and land. Thank you. Sister Sasha, coming to you. What does Genesis 2 verses 15 and 19 tell you about our relationship to creation? Okay, Genesis 2 verses 15 reads, 
Then the Lord God took the man and put him in the Garden of Eden to tend and keep it. And 19 reads, out of the ground, the Lord God formed every beast of the field and every bird of the air and brought them to Adam to see what he would call them. And whatever Adam called each living creature, that was its name. Okay, I believe that these two verses, they not only remind, remind us of the relationship, but also our responsibility as humans to creation. Um, Adam was given dominion over the land, over the animals, over every creature. As for children, Adam, children of Adam, or from the lineage of Adam, we are also responsible to govern the world in the same way that God gave to Adam. And oftentimes we forget to do that. Um, sinful world or not, it's still God's creation. The animals are his, the world is his, the earth is his, etc. Um, last week I went to Oxford Street and came across the Extinction Rebellion protests. Not sure if everyone's heard what's going on there. They've shut off the whole street. You've got naked people dancing, protesting, doing whatever, um, believing that they need to change the way that we govern the world. And although some people say their methods are questionable, they are standing up for the world that's been long abused. And that's something that as Christians, we also sometimes forget to take on. Mm. But it's God's world. And we are here to govern over God's world. Um, consider, it's interesting because sometimes we just got to consider what we do as an individual. How much harm are we doing? How much can we heal? What can we do? And I think that is our relationship as well as our responsibility to creation. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Uh, I, I've got a question later on about that. But um, yes, Extinction Rebellion, um, they are definitely, uh, I suppose, putting it out there. But however, Let's, let's see, Pastor, let me come to you now. You know, any comments coming in or thoughts on, on whether exhaustion after Sabbath is in conflict with God's plan? Uh, there is a, a controversial statement. I'm going to take that last okay. from Tom Tom. And I think Tom Tom is in South Africa, if my, mind's, if my memory is certainly right. But Paul says um, he keeps the Sabbath by being active um, in terms of helping um, during the lockdown on the AV. Yes. on the AV, just sharing God's word. Mm -hmm. um, Peter says, I'm busy, busy doing God's work, and he used the word change. In Peter's mind, it's about change of activity rather than the exhaustion bit, right? And VJ says, um, VK says, enjoy, she enjoys doing the choir. She's using her talent to spread God's word. Uh, Elder, um, Brother Omenga says, Sabbath rest is a spiritual act. I like the idea. You know, it's a spiritual act. So you're, you're involved in, your focus is very spiritual. Um, now, Tom Tom says, I'm going to read what he says. Um, we, do, we, do, we don't have to exhaust ourselves on the Sabbath because we can do God's work on, on any other day mm -hmm. because we don't have time for God any other day we exhaust ourselves on the Sabbath. Mm -hmm. uh, to some extent, that is true, but to some extent, that is not true. Because by and large, a lot of us, we work, you work, you work. And so you can focus on the Sabbath more in doing God's work. But during the week, you're doing other activities, which I think, um, I don't know if he wants to re respond to that, but you're doing other activities. And so when we talk about being exhausted, it's because our, folk, our, our pure focus is on doing um, some charity or some, some, um, some other um, divine work. Um, Angela says, resting and relating to our Creator and Redeemer will automatically drive us to look at the rest of creation with different eyes. And I think that's going to be coming through because I think um, Keith made that point, mm -hmm. Dr. Burton made that point, which is very important, and Sasha throw in this, um, you know, re rebellion, extinction, or is it extinction, rebellion? One of them. One of them, right? Mm -hmm. But she threw that idea in. Mm -hmm. Sun Sun said, the, the way I view rest is that of a big re reset. I like the idea of a reset in, in a simple way. You are resetting yourself. You are refocusing and you're reconnecting. I like those R's. Reset, relationship, and reconnecting. Okay? And, and resetting because the Sabbath, actually, you should work before you take rest. Because that's what God did. He worked first, and then he, take, he took rest so to, to show mankind. 
Hannah made the point. She says, Hannah says, in, in, in Jewish tradition, rest on Sabbath means we have to do things differently. Mm -hmm. you, I like the word differently from the rest of the week. In, in the difference, there is rest from the unusual, from the usual. Mm -hmm. So I like those concepts that are coming through. And, and um, Alana, I think, responding to Sasha's point about extinction, rebellion extinction is that we are to be God's stewards of the earth. Mm -hmm. That's going to be coming through because I have some notes on that later on, but I don't want to go into that at this point in time. But rest, relationship, reconnecting, and, um, and reset. Those, I think, are powerful points. Can we add reset to that, please? Rest, relationship, reconnecting, and reset. Good, good. Sabbath. Sabbath. Good Thank points. You. Thank yes. you, Pastor. Congregation, we want to hear from you while you're thinking on that. I think, Keith, you had a point you wanted to come back on? Yes, uh -huh. yeah. So, um, Pastor, um, I'm, I'm understanding your point about Jesus and work on the Sabbath, essentially, and the spiritual work. Uh, but I, I kind of understand where a brother from South Africa is coming from, because if you look at the original context of the Sabbath, we're looking at the um, Sabbath being kept um, by a community uh, that was working all the time. So it was literally about rest and, you know, sleeping and doing whatever you want to regenerate and to re-energize that, you know, they, they basically had a six day week. We have a five day week, you know, so they had a six day week. And so they were basically working all the time. And so I think, yes, it is lawful to do God on the Sabbath. But um, if you can recall, um, even with Jesus, uh, when he was accused of working on the Sabbath, um, he understood that what he was doing was not necessarily the norm at that time. And he referred to David and his people eating from the showbread, that which was not um, permissible, and he did it. So I don't think that people should kind of see the Sabbath as a day when that's when they can do all their good things. And I think that's what our friend from South Africa was saying. You know, people wait, people, people are evil for six days, and then for the Sabbath, like, oh, we're going to do all our good things, we're going to do our work here, because we should be doing the work of Christ every day the work of Christ every day. And as pastors, you know, we, we do do more <laughs> on the Sabbath, you know, um, which again, the Pharisees thought was a violation mm. um, of the Sabbath. Uh, but there were some things of necessity that we will do. We have to preach, we have to do visitation, we have to do some things. But um, many people, they store all those good things up just for the Sabbath. Mm. And they're exhausted at the end of the Sabbath. In fact, too many Adventists have their day of rest on Sundays. <laughs> That's when they sleep in. That's when they get re-energized, etc. So I do believe, um, as our friend from South Africa said, that we need to um, ensure that we're doing the work of God all the time, every day, so the Sabbath can truly be a Shabbat, can truly be a rest, truly be a time when, yes, we can fellowship with our loved ones, but we don't have to say, let's go to the nursing home, let's do this, let's do that, and that, because we've been doing that throughout the course of the week. Good, good points, good points. Thank you. Let's keep our comments coming in and, and looking forward to hearing from our congregation as well. Um, let me go out with another question to you then. Bearing in mind our relationship with God's creation, how can we as Adventists be good stewards of nature without taking on political agendas. So Sister Sasha mentioned just now about Extinction Rebellion. Last year, some of us learned the name of Greta Thunberg. I think that's the surname for the first time. So considering the remit that God has given us as stewards of his creation, how can we be good stewards without taking on political agendas. Look forward to hearing your thoughts on that, please, um, both from our live congregation as well as those of you that are online. So while you're thinking of your answers, last week we did a verse-by-verse -verse comparison, if you recall, of the Sabbath commandment given in Exodus 20 with that restated to the generation that were born free um, and that was found in Deuteronomy 5. So, so Sister Sash, if I can come to you first this time, how does Genesis 4 verses 6 and 7 and 2 Peter 2, 18 and 19 indicate other forms of slavery? So Genesis 4, 6 to 7 and 2 Peter 2, 18 and 19. Looking for modern slavery or I should say other forms of slavery. Thank you, Johnny. Um, Genesis 4, verse 6 to 7 reads, So the Lord said to Cain, Why are you angry? And why is your countenance fallen? 
If you do well, will you not be accepted? And if you do not do well, sin lies at the door and its desire is for you, but you should rule over it. Now for me, God is encouraging Cain not to be a slave to sin. He's telling him that he should rule over his desires to do wrong, such as being ruled by his anger. Now what we've got to understand is the true goodness of God in this situation, because you've got to remember that by now Cain had already dishonored God. So God could have turned around and been angry at Cain, but instead he chose to encourage him. At that point, Cain refused to acknowledge God's grace and rejected it in favor of his own anger, which as we know, ultimately led to the murder of his brother. Mm. Now, we also have to consider that God knew the consequences down the road, should Cain choose to continue um, the, the um, behavior he was given out. After this behavior, God could have said to him, listen, fix up or it's all gonna go wrong. But instead he chose to encourage him. He gave him two paths that he could choose. He gave him the consequence of each path. And then ultimately it was up to Cain to choose the right path. Um, the next one, 2 Peter 2 verse 8 to 19, it says, when the flesh speaks great swelling words of emptiness, they allure through the lust of the flesh, through lewdness. The ones who have actually escaped from those who live in error. While they promise them liberty, they themselves are slave of corruption. For by whom a person is overcome, by him also he is brought into bondage. So while Cain's one was speaking of being a slave to your anger and your emotions, this one is talking about being a slave to your pride and your lust. Um, these teachers, teachers that um, Peter is speaking of were offering liberty when then their self were already slaves to their pride. So the liberty they were offering was a liberty to become slaves of lust. Their message was arrogant because it was a contradiction to the message of Christ. Mm -hmm. It was futile because whoever followed it would find himself a slave to the lust. So in verse 19, you see Peter's using a bit of sarcasm to emphasize the ridiculousness of the possibility that people who are slaves to sin themselves could actually free someone else from being a slave. Mm, mm, good points there. And, and, and this is, the, uh, I think, the, the, the message that's coming out. Whilst, uh, thank God, we may not be enslaved with, with slave masters whipping us and beating us, is recognizing that we could be slaves to anger and to our lust, etc. Um, Dr. Burton, I want to understand more how the Sabbath releases us from this bondage. How does Romans 6 verses 1 through 7 amplify this, please? Oh, if you can just unmute, because our lip reading isn't too good, sir. Um, it, it, it would very much help if I unmuted it. <laughs> <laughs> and when I finish, some may, some may say, I wish it stayed muted. But anyway, <laughs> let's, um, <laughs> let's go over here. Uh, um, 6, 1 through 7. Um, what shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? Certainly not. How shall we who die to sin live any longer in it? Or do you not know that as many of us as were baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? Therefore, we were buried with him through baptism into death, that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life. For if we have been united together in the likeness of his death, certainly we shall also be in the likeness of, of his resurrection. Knowing this, that our old man was crucified with him, that the body of sin might be done away with, that we should no longer be slaves of sin, for he who has died has been freed from sin. You notice I read that very, very quickly, and here's the reason why. Um, I remember the setup to this question, um, uh, this whole notion of the born free generation. And this whole notion of Deuteronomy chapter um, 5 being for a born free generation is actually based on a liberal Western understanding of community. And so um, as it relates to uh, the community to whom um, Moses speaks in Deuteronomy chapter 5, and many uh, cultures to this day, um, our ancestors' past experiences are also our past experiences. And so historically, me historical memory, sorry, um, is important, and I don't believe it should be spiritualized. And it's for this reason why 
Um, I don't like the author's attempt or the lesson's attempt. And re remember, oftentimes we study the Sabbath school lesson, but this is what is supposed to be an adult Bible study guide, which leads us to the scripture. And so just because we have a comment in the lesson, the person who wrote, and you know, I wrote one of these, you know, um, it doesn't mean that that's necessarily uh, what the Bible is saying. And so I believe that the attempt to tie the Sabbath command to Romans chapter 6 uh, reflects the tendency to spiritualize the practical meaning of the text. And so when we talk about slavery in Deuteronomy chapter 5, uh, I really said the Sabbath, we're talking about actual slavery, not spiritual slavery. And I think we do an injustice when we try to make it spiritual. And um, the understanding that we see reflected uh, in the lesson uh, promotes a dharmic God. And that's, when I say a dharmic God, a God that we find in Hinduism, in Buddhism, and other um, of those uh, uh, karmic religions that emphasize individual perfection. But the God of the Sabbath, yes, he's interested in the individual, but not just the individual. He's interested in community. And so the God of the Sabbath that we see in Deuteronomy chapter 5 is not this dharmic God, this individualized God who wants us to merge into him, but it's a trade union God, okay? A God who is concerned about the holistic health of all of his creation. And uh, what I find ironic, even as we um, look at the way in which the lesson at this point tends to spiritualize um, a text, the Deuteronomy chapter 5 command, which obviously has a physical meaning, is, is something that has to do um, with liberation to the point uh, where we don't have um, the haves lording it over the have-nots. We don't have the capitalistic barons um, exploiting those uh, of the underclass. That's what this text is all about, and the tendency to spiritualize it again um, lends to a type of mystical reasoning that opens the doors for um, theologies uh, that uh, promote Christ as the new Sabbath, et cetera, this mystical thing. So I, I, I don't believe we need to um, shift away from the practical understanding of the text. This is about slavery. This is about economics. This is about the worth of human beings. And the attempt to spiritualize, um, I don't believe, helps um, in our attempt to understand the power of scripture as it relates to social relationships, as it relates to community. And so, yes, I read those seven verses very quickly because I saw what the author was doing in the Sabbath school um, board, whoever it was, because after you write, there's a board that, you know, edits stuff. And I saw what, 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 what they were doing, but that's a Western tendency to individualize and intellectualize, which moves away from what we see clearly in the Bible that there is a notion of liberation, liberation that cares about the human, the entire human, and not just the human mind. Deep, deep thoughts. Uh, can I jump in there? Please, I, I, go ahead, I, I, I won't even attempt to, um, to theologize, <laughs> um, but good, very, very good point. I think you raised some question, Johnny, and um, I think a lot of our members seem to be a part of Extinction Rebellion uh -huh. in, in their own way. Okay. I'm not saying they're a part of it. And by the way, I don't, th I, I don't think there's anything wrong in having a political agenda mm -hmm. once it is for the benefit of humanity. Mm -hmm. I'm just, because Daniel was a civil servant, right? And, and he did what he did for the benefit of humanity. Um, Paul, it says, based on the question you ask, um, we, as Adventists, sometimes we can destroy the earth because we say Jesus is coming, so why should I care? Mm -hmm. uh, Carline says um, that God speaks through nature. And therefore, we should respect nature. We should, we should look after it. Uh, the heavens declare the glory of God. Mm -hmm. um, um, so this concept on, 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 on YouTube is coming that we must be good stewards. And Sun Sun talks about how we are building up so many concrete jungles and then we have floods. Mm -hmm. And so many people are dying um, because of flood. Here's a thought that I think Rose or, or the person who is running on, 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 on live stream writes. She says, we need, to, we need to first have a relationship with nature. So many of us are so far removed from nature, we don't even know where our food comes from mm. and how they are produced, right? Obviously, there's this, you know, we have a challenge yet. Um, should we stay alive or should nature stay alive? You know, um, economics over, over, over nature, over people, you know, there are competing issues that we have to deal with 
yeah? But as Christians, as Christians, as Adventists, more than, more than anything else, we must respect the things around us. We must value the things around us. And, and it is very, very important that we care for our environment yes. and look after it. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's unquestionable for us not to do so. So that's what seems to be coming through. Here's a controversial point, and I, and I don't know why. We can be slaves to a Sabbath that causes as much stress as any other day of the week. Visitors and observers see no benefit of a Sabbath as reflected in the life of Sabbath observers. I won't call the name of the person who wrote that one at all. Um, but, but that's a very powerful point mm -hmm. that has been made. Mm -hmm. And that's what Jesus says. He, he said the same thing to the scribes and the Pharisees, the way they kept the Sabbath, that nobody was actually valuing the Sabbath. Is it in Isaiah 58? Mm -hmm. You know, um, you, you're doing stuff on the Sabbath, but you're not having a relationship with me on the Sabbath. Mm -hmm. you, you know, you, 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 are, you, are, you are not doing stuff on the Sabbath, but you're not caring for the people who need to be cared for on the Sabbath. So, and as Keith rightfully said, Dr. Burton rightfully says, the Sabbath must not be a burden for us to, to do work for others mm -hmm. because we didn't do it in the week. Mm -hmm. We must always endeavor to do stuff for other people um, every day of the week where we are, we are doing God's work every single day of the week. Angela says, stewardship is an important consequence of creation, and the weekly Sabbath reminds us of our stewardship. That's a very powerful point. Can I just... Just, just um, and then over. I'm sure the audience or members here Hopefully. have something to say. But let me just give a shout out to Mark from Bristol. Mark is one of our avid supporters. Mark was riding his bike a couple of weeks ago. He had an accident. Oh dear. Almost died. I, I gave Mark a call. I had a prayer with him. Um, so, Mark, it's nice to see that you're up and about. And may God continue to bless you. Tom Tom is actually in Dudley in the in Midlands. He says, Nature is a part of our ecosystem. And we therefore need to look after. Nothing, there's nothing spiritual about that. It's just what we need to do as individuals. Over right. to you, Elder Johnny. Thank you. Thank you very much. The congregation, you know, don't leave all the comments to those online. We'd, we'd like to hear from you as well. So let me, let me go out then with something else. How do you explain? I, I can see some seasoned Adventist members sitting in front of you. How do you explain that Sabbath gives you freedom to someone who views it as restrictive. So whether it's a child speaking to you, it could be a, a new Adventist that comes along and they're saying to you, you know, explain to me, sister so-and-so or brother so-and-so, how does Sabbath give you freedom when it seems to be full of restriction? How would you respond to that person? Elder Johnny, can I add something to that? Go on then. Okay, right, about restriction, but here's a question that can be added to it. So, okay, so how can you, say it again, Elder Johnny, how can you? So, you didn't even hear my question. No, I heard your question. I, I just, okay. how do you explain I'll the Sabbath? I'll say it again, I'll say it again. How do you explain the Sabbath? Just for you, you as you're my pastor. <laughs> Thank so, you. So, the original question states, how do you explain that Sabbath gives you freedom to someone who views it as restrictive? You, you yeah. want to change that? No, 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 I want to add, and, and how can you express that freedom if you're held captive by hatred, envy, jealousy, strife, bitterness, and all manner of resentment. Wow, that's deep. Okay. So I, I'm moving away just from the physicality of it sure. to the attitude that you have in terms of keeping the Sabbath. Okay, so we want to hear from you. Okay, we want to hear from you. Um, you you've heard the, 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 the questions and the thoughts. We want to hear from you. Just make your way to the microphone. So moving on. Now, in reference to Sabbath keeping, the Sabbath, uh, the Holy Sabbath, um, as outlined in Exodus 20, verse 10, or I should say the, the, the commandment about the Sabbath day, as outlined in Exodus 20, verse 10, specifically states, everyone within your household should refrain from working, including thy stranger within thy gates. So, Dr. Burton, I'm coming to you first of all. How does Exodus 19, verse 6, and 1 Peter 2, verse 9, help us understand the role that God had for ancient Israel and the role for spiritual Israel, if I can use that expression today? So Exodus 19, verse 6, 1 Peter 2, verse 9, we're looking to understand the role that God has for Israel. 
Okay, so um, Exodus 19, 6 states, And you shall be to me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. These are the words which you shall speak to the children of Israel. And it's quoted again by Peter in 1 Peter 2, verse 9. And it's interesting how he words it there. He says, but you are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, his own special people, that you may proclaim the praises of him who called you out of darkness into a marvelous light. Now, um, Elder Johnny, as I look at this and look at the question, you know, um, I'm thinking it may not necessarily be a role um, that uh, these texts are really talking about, but a conditional prophetic status uh, based on fidelity to the covenant. In fact, um, let's look at the foundational text there in Exodus, and I'm going to uh, just go to the couple of verses that come before that, because oftentimes um, we read the text without mm -hmm. um, the context. And when we read from verse 3 in Exodus chapter 19, it says, Then Moses went up to God, and the Lord called him uh, from the mountain and said, This is what you are to say to the descendants of Jacob and what you are to tell the people of Israel. You yourselves have seen what I did to Egypt and how I carried you on eagles' wings and brought you to myself. Now, verse 5, this is very important. Now, if you obey me uh, fully and keep my covenant, then out of all nations you will be my treasured possession although the whole earth is mine. You will be um, for me a kingdom of peace and a holy nation. Uh, these are the words you are to speak to the Israelites. And so um, when we look at this whole notion of role and status, I think it's important for us to remember uh, that this was something that was promised to a people if they chose to maintain covenant relationship with God. And oftentimes, um, many of us try uh, to um, claim the status without necessarily entering into that covenant. And what is that covenant? Well, the original covenant, as we look at the covenant, is, which continues to be renewed, but the covenant that was given to Abraham, which is basically through your seed, all nations uh, shall be blessed. All nations shall be blessed. And so when we look at God's um, covenant with Israel and his calling them to uh, be this special nation, this nation of priests. It's a nation that's not trying to be his people, but it's a nation uh, that so embodies um, his principles, his covenant principles, that others will say, wow, we want to be like that. And even as it relates to the Sabbath and the stranger, uh, we look at this in the sense of example okay so they're in covenant with god they're enjoying the sabbath so much they're enjoying everything that comes with god that others are saying wow we want to be a part of that right mm -hmm. and and um I'm, 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 I, I, tell me if i'm going too far <laughs> in this explanation over here but this whole idea of the stranger within the gates because this they were studying the stranger within the gate um the alien resident Okay, uh, the alien resident, um, we look at this alien resident and think, okay, who is this immigrant? Who is this stranger? You know, it's not necessarily someone you don't know, <laughs> you know, uh, but it's someone who is from somewhere else who is, uh, he's in your gate, so it's a guest. And usually, you have a guest in your house, you're going to make sure that guest is taken care of, etc. All right, but even the slave who was in your house would normally take care of that guest. You know, the guest would have to get his own tea that day. Okay, the guests are going to have to make their own breakfast that day, okay, in a sense. And they're going to understand the importance of Sabbath in the way in which you value people. Mm -hmm. And if you look again at that command in Deuteronomy chapter 5, it directly ties the treatment of the, of, of, of the stranger, or rather um, the need for the stranger in your gates uh, to join in with Sabbath observance with the command to make sure that your slaves get rest. And so the stranger within your gates is observing the Sabbath by not thinking they could ring that bell and that slave runs down, okay? So there's a cultural context. Now, how we apply that to the 21st century, I think that's the challenge of what we're discussing here. How does that apply? But I think there may be times when we try to apply so many minutiae that we get like the Pharisees. 
<laughs> that we begin to create these new laws and these new restrictions. Mm -hmm. But the stranger who is within your gate should say, wow, you know, this Sabbath is a thing that expresses and enforces and endorses a common humanity. Mm -hmm. That even those within the gates, again, in the historical context, even the slaves, those who are usually supposed to serve me and bow down to me, are my equal yes. of this very important day. Yes, good, good points there. Thank you. Sister Sasha, um, a, a reiteration of the Sabbath command in Exodus 23 verse 12 uses a different word in respect of your Sabbath household. Could you just read and expand on that, please? Exodus 23 verse 12. Okay, 23 verse 12 reads, Six day you shall do your work, and on the seventh day you shall rest, that your ox and your donkey may rest, and the son of your female servant and stranger may be refreshed. Um, Sabbath rest is not just for us. Um, the servants, the strangers, even the animals should be given a Sabbath rest, as um, Dr. Burton just mentioned. And it's quite interesting that this phrase appears three times in the Bible. We got it in Exodus 20, verse 10. We got it in Deuteronomy 5, verse 14. And that kind of shows the importance and the fact that God wants to emphasize the fact that Sabbath rest is not just for us, but it's also for those around us. Now, the acceptance of Sabbath is something that many people miss, or as Pastor Smith said earlier, they overlook or they misunderstand. Um, as Dr. Burton said, we can't save all our good deeds up for the Sabbath. Okay, we should be good every day and not just Seventh day Christians. Um, if we save all our good deeds up for the Sabbath, then what type of rest is that? We just become a one day Christian. In the same way that God created all people, he created the Sabbath. The Sabbath is not only about our relationship with God, but it's also our relationship with others. It's interesting that the question is phrased for us to set an example. Okay, it says, you should, it says six days, you shall do your work on the seventh day, you shall rest so that your ox, your donkey may rest. The son of your female servant, the stranger may be refreshed you should rest so that they can rest as well. So we must set that example. It's about resting and relating, not only with our father, which is very important, but also with other people. Um, for instance, when I was growing up, we always had family breakfasts on the Sabbath. The one day we could come together and sit around and not be rushing off to school, to work, to do whatever we had to do that was a way for us to rest as a family and relate. Um, I suppose this verse is reminding us that we were created by God um, and we're loved by the same God as well. Yes. It's trying to move us away from the hustle and bustle and dismissiveness that comes with everyday life yes. and just stop and refresh, regenerate and rest. Yes. Yeah, and that word refresh, it's in line with what Pastor Smith was saying before I come to him about this reset. And, and that's the point, is that you could be going somewhere and sometimes you just need to just make sure your objectives, your focus is in the right place. Pastor Smith. Yeah, I like how um, Sasha rephrased the text. You know, she rephrased about you setting that example. Now, on, 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 on um, live stream, that, that is coming through that um, you cannot control the people within your environment. And I think um, a May, May Red, or Red May, is asking the question that she has a lodger, and um, how, you know, and she keeps the Sabbath. Um, how does she, uh, uh, you know, allow the, the lodgers to keep the Sabbath? But I think Sasha has, the point Sasha made actually covers that concept, is that you are keeping the Sabbath you are demonstrating to that individual, then that individual then has the choice, has to make the choice to keep the Sabbath himself or herself. Um, but Angela says, Sabbath is a wonderful experience for me if I have a relationship with God and it's not a burden. Love makes the difference to the mindset. Mm -hmm. I find that to be very powerful. Uh, Statue of the Lord, who has made a lot of comment, but I'm gonna pick this point out that Statue of the Lord has made. And he or she says, we talk a lot about our relation with God on the Sabbath, but 
it is also about God's relationship with us That's on right. the Sabbath. Mm -hmm. I find that to be very simple, mm -hmm. but very profound. Yes. You know, my relationship with God. So what is God's relationship with you on the Sabbath? Because the scribes and the Pharisees felt they had a relationship with God on the Sabbath. But God said, we don't have a relationship mm -hmm. because the Sabbath is, is too restrictive. I want to read a comment by Akusa on, 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 um, on live stream. And, and she, she, made, she made the point. She says, when, when she started out as an Adventist, she felt that the Sabbath was restrictive. She said, but after keeping it for a few years, um, she recognized it actually free us, free her from life's busyness and rat race. Amen. And she said, that was when she found true freedom. Garnet Greenwich says, the joy and the freedom of Sabbath keeping is the outcome, I love this, of a joyful, happy, using two adjectives there, mm -hmm. joyful and happy relationship with him. And, and he says, I'm from Trinidad and Tobago. Mm -hmm. so, so that is coming through Ella Johnny on both live stream and on YouTube. The concept that is not just about your relationship with God, yes. but, but God's relationship with you. Um, if you if, and then... Um, a Rosa Sosas, a Rosa Sosahai says, if you have no relationship with God, the Sabbath is boring and long. Mm. That is coming mm. through. Some very powerful thought. Um, and that is, that for me is, is, is very, very critical. I, I'm, I'm waiting to hear what the members well, here have I've, to say about it. I've got a special question just for our congregation. Obviously online you can take it as well, but I want to hear from our congregation. So this one is specifically for yourself. Here's the scene. We'll make it real. A stranger is due within your gates next Sabbath. Now, the stranger is not a Sabbath keeper, but knows that your family are. So they know what they're coming into. How would you change your 24-hour Sabbath routine for next week? Or if you would not change it, why not? All right? So strangers coming in, they know you're Sabbath keepers. You know they are not a Sabbath keeper, but they're coming to you for the Sabbath. How would you change your 24-hour period? So thinking of everything, the minutiae, maybe what you're singing in worship, if you're singing in worship, um, what would you change for that time when the stranger is there? Or if you won't change anything, why not? would like to hear your response to that, because I know we have some seasoned Sabbath keepers looking at me, so we'd like to hear from you. Just make your way to the microphone. And while still making, making their way to the microphone, Alana says that she had to show her children how to keep the Sabbath. Uh, not just about church. She says, you know, she spent time feeding the needy, visiting the sick and caring for the poor. And now the, her children understand it's not just about going to church. So maybe that will give our, 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 our members here sitting in the congregation uh, a startup. Sure. Or, yeah. or, or you might look at it that if you think you have to change it, why is that? So we'd like to hear from you because we know we have some good thinkers and speakers in our congregation. But we're battling against the clock, so we're going to move on while I give our congregation a chance to think. Um, we spoke about the Pharisees earlier. So now, in a position of leadership, the way to avoid gray areas is to, and, and, and this could lead to one's own interpretation. So the way to avoid gray areas and your own interpretation is to have procedures, rules and laws. Now these may evolve over time and sometimes this evolution loses its original spirit and purpose. So Sister Sasha, just summarize in the interest of time um, a charge that was brought to Jesus by the religious leaders that's found in John 5 verses 7 through 16. But if you just summarize the well-known story for us, please. Okay. I'm going to keep it simple. Um, Jesus, in this story, Jesus makes the blind man see. <laughs> okay? He makes the blind man see. In the eyes of the Jews, this was a sin because he did it on the Sabbath. Okay? Now, what we have to understand here is that the attitude of the Jews was not unusual. People often see what they want to see. The Jews didn't see love in action. They saw an infringement of the law. 
The response illustrates the power of all closed systems, religious or otherwise. And I suppose the only point I want to point out in this story is that oftentimes we allow people's interpretation or what we think people are going to think to dictate the way that we live our Christian lifestyle. Okay. Yes, we don't want to offend, and yes, we don't want to cause anyone to turn back, but at the same time, we have to remember who we are living for. So if Jesus was to live by the Jews and what the Jews expect of him, he would have never healed the blind man. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, John 5, 7 to 16 was actually the one where Jesus told the um, paralytic man to take up his bed, but obviously the principle of what you're saying is exactly the same. But just imagine, you know, instead of these people looking on and celebrating that this person of 38 years has been healed, they're saying, why are you carrying your bed? And then he's saying, well, the man that healed me told me to, to carry my bed. So we, we, we can see, as you're saying, that the concept of what Christ has done totally went out of their mind. So, Dr. Burton, before I come to you, just a reminder that if you want to, to say something, just raise your hand and you can make your way to the microphone in church. Um, that's over on this side, and we can hear from you. So, Dr. Burton, um, bearing that story in mind, or both the stories, the one that Sasha um, summarized and, and, and I did as well, you know, although we examined Isaiah 58, verses 12 to 14 last week, in your opinion, now, didn't these Jews who challenged Jesus understand Isaiah's words about the Sabbath? What's your thoughts, sir? Okay, well, let's um, look at Isaiah's words from last week, um, uh, 58, 12 to 14. It says, your people will rebuild the ancient ruins and will rise up the age-old foundations. You'll be called a pair of broken walls restorer of streets with dwellings. And then 13 and 14, many of us have memorized this. If you keep your feet from breaking the Sabbath and from doing as you please on my holy day, if you call the Sabbath a delight and the Lord's holy day honorable, and if you honor it by not going your own way and not doing as you please or speak in idle words, then you will find your joy in the Lord and I will cause you to ride in triumph on the heights of the land and to feast on the inheritance of your father Jacob for the mouth of the Lord has spoken. Mm -hmm. And Elder Johnny, as I look at this in light of the question, and uh, we're looking back then at those Jewish leaders, and I usually like to use the word Jewish leaders because that's oftentimes how um, uh, John uses the word yeah. Jews in his gospel, mm -hmm. you know, uh, rather than sort of bring modern Jews into this whole <laughs> discussion, mm -hmm. you know? Mm -hmm. And so when we look at this, um, the Jewish leaders who challenged Jesus and the words of Isaiah, I think it's so easy, Elder Johnny, to um, point back uh, to those who lived back then, to those Jewish leaders, to those Pharisees, to those legalists. However, um, we need to remember that this is an indictment on all Sabbath keepers. All Sabbath keepers who worship the day, someone just said, ouch, who <laughs> worship the day, and don't understand the day. Mm. Don't understand what the day is all about. Don't understand that this is the day of freedom, it's a day of liberty. It's a gift, not a chain. And so as we look at this and the way in which this text has been applied, again, most have read those last two verses, but have not read the entire chapter. And when read it in its entirety, it becomes clear that Isaiah chapter 58 is really an indictment against religious formalism and a type of religious formalism that eclipses the social justice mandate of the gospel. And so he's speaking against those um, who uh, don't provide food to the hungry, who don't loose the chains of injustice, who don't get involved in things that may be um, political in the sense that uh, there is an arm of society that's pushing it uh, for their own purposes, but it, it, just because it does not, uh, or that group uh, does not believe what we believe, does not mean that the issues that they're raising are not grounded in what God calls us to do in Isaiah chapter 58. And so there are some times where we can form these unlikely relationships uh, to do the work of the gospel. And again, I raise all this. Uh, because when we look at our indictment 
against the Jewish authorities, the Pharisees and the rabbis, and those who were so strict about Sabbath observance that they forgot that God loves people. Yes. And God gave the Sabbath to people as a gift. That all of a sudden the Sabbath now becomes elevated and people become diminished. And so even as we look at this passage, even as we look at this passage, it's important for us to remember that Sabbath is about people and we should not go down the same road as the Pharisees of old and make the Sabbath a burden Amen. rather than a blessing. Amen. Thank you so much for summarizing. Ah, we have a member of our congregation, Elder Belsey. Now, um, the question you asked about the person coming to your home, is the person familiar with you or is he just a complete stranger? Familiar with you. So the person would have already known that I am a Seventh-day Adventist and that we keep the Sabbath, isn't it? Correct. So therefore, I would explain to the person beforehand what Sabbath is like, how we celebrate the Sabbath, how we worship. And when that person comes, I will make sure that the person is part of that worship and try not to use these jargons that we as Adventists tend to use when we are, um, when we are witnessing to non-Seventh-day Adventists and make them feel apart. Ask, what can you contribute? Is there anything you'd like to contribute towards the worship? And make them feel part of the family, part of the family of God. Good, simple, yeah. I mean, that, that, that's fine. I'm sure there are many other answers, but not everyone is as brave as you. It's things like, for example, if, you know, you, on your Friday evening, you sing all the Sabbath hymns in order in the book, and that's your routine, but the people there may know all things bright and beautiful, and may know how great thou art, and may know great is thy faithfulness. There's nothing wrong with singing those songs as well. And I mean, you know, People probably do, do those things anyway. Um, oh, we have another point before I'm coming to Pastor Royson. Elder Stanley. No, just to add that, uh, that would be an excellent opportunity for us to witness to that visitor. Good point. Thank you very much. Pastor. Do you know, that very point came up on, on, um, on YouTube about witnessing and, and evangelizing. Mm -hmm. I'm going to tweak this a bit. Um, care, <laughs> you know, care. Um, care. I think sometimes we are so, we are so and, I, and I might be stoned because I'm a pastor for saying this, right? <laughs> Everybody comes into our house, we want to convert them. I'm not saying that shouldn't be our goal. Mm -hmm. What about caring as human being? That's, <laughs> and I think that's the point um, that, that, that um, Dr. Burton made, that people should be more important to us. And I think when, we have, when there's an intentionality about people, then our, our Sabbath mentality will change. Um, Brother Omwenga um, 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 made this point. God doesn't want empty ritual. He wants our heart to turn to him first. Then loving action benefiting our fellow man will follow. True service can only come from a contrite heart. And that's the point I'm trying to make. If, we, if, if our, our intention is to evangelize, we might lack the caring bit. Now that might sound a bit like an oxymoron, mm -hmm. But if we go in, if somebody comes to my house, my first thinking is not, I'm going to make him an Adventist. I'm going to make him. My first thinking is, I'm going to love this person. I'm going to care for this person. Um, Margaret, Margaret agrees with me. She said, the Sabbath keeping has become a, must become a lifestyle. It has to be a lifestyle, we, a natural part of who we are. Yes. And, and that is why we are, we are not, we are not seven, seven, seven day Adventists, but we are seven day Adventists. Yes which means that every day our lifestyle reflects God. Every day we are reaching out, we are caring for others. That's what we are, we are, we are seventh day Adventists, not seventh day Adventists. Um, Akusa said it is important to show the essence of Sabbath, making people feel welcome. Karen says caring about people is a powerful witness. So I don't need to be, uh, you know, I, I can be intentional, through my care. In my, in, my, in my home, even if my guests do not join my worship, they get to experience the peace and quiet of the day, and now we are on live stream, they get to hear the service Amen. without being asked to sit through it. Amen. So, Amen. so, you know, I'm trying to say that, you know, our thinking, we have to shift our thinking 
as, as Adventists, you know, evangelize. No, no, let's care. That's what Jesus did. Yes. He fed the man. He healed the man on the Sabbath. And the Jews were worried about healing the man on the Sabbath. There's a, I want to make a, if we go back on, just up a bit for me, John. There's a point up there that I just lost. Um, here we go. Um, Rufus says, um, I will tactically include them in the worship by encouraging them to read Bible text, share a special song, and, and prayerfully pray that God will minister them in a special way. I will, I will um, tactically. Absolutely. Um, strategically. <laughs> um, no, let's not, let's not invite people through cover. That's the point. Yes. Let's, let's, let's open up ourselves, give them a choice. Yes, and okay. show them love through our worship. Excellent. Over Thank to you, Elder Thank Johnny. Thank you. We're, we're, we're running out of time. So um, just briefly, uh, Dr. Burton, as we get older and more experienced, the more we understand and appreciate the importance of signs. Um, instead of reading it, if you can just summarize, Exodus 31, verses 13, 16, and 17 says that the Sabbath is a sign, but what is it a sign of, or what else is it a sign of? Um, so if you can just summarize what, was, what you find in Exodus 31, 13, 16, and 17, in the interest of time, please, sir. But you need to summarize that we can hear you, if you can just... Yes, 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 Thank I you. will do so. <laughs> <laughs> yes, and so Exodus chapter um, 31, as we look at verse 13, Sabbath is a sign that God has sanctified us, or God has made us holy. And again, that's talking about the specialness of humans. Mm. Okay, he's imparted some of himself into us, which means we are special, we are somebody. Okay? So on Sabbath, we're reminded that human life is worth something. Mm. Okay, and then of course, from 16 and 17, it goes back again to the creator. It's a sign that God is creator, or that God is the one who made it. God is the one who knows what's best for us. Yes. And so we look at this whole notion, we are special, it's a sign that he sanctifies us. And again, the word sanctify means he has made us holy. <laughs> you know, he has made us like him. And then finally, um, the fact that God is creator, mm. that God's the one who creates us. He knows what's best for us. He knows uh, that after working so hard, we need to rest. Amen. We need to relax. We need to <sighs> exhale. <laughs> Amen. Powerful signs. And, and Sister Sasha, I mean, how do we apply this to current times we are living in and the ongoing importance of, of the Sabbath from creation. Um, Sabbath is a sign, like Dr. Burton said, between God and his people. Um, Sabbath rest is an invitation for us to practice for eternity. So how do we apply it to our current times? We live in such a fast-paced society mm. that doesn't encourage us to stop. It, yeah. uh, it makes us feel like we're being lazy if we relax. It makes us feel like we're wasting our life if we just stop for a week or two and take some R&R. &R. So the fact that the Sabbath is there on the seventh day and it says to us, rest, stop, rest, it allows us to rejuvenate and ensure that our mindset is, is where God wants it to be. Yes. It allows us to do the good that we need to do. Because as I said before, man was we were, Sabbath was created by God. And it's not something we should or can just dismiss. Amen. Amen. Panelists, as you prepare your takeaway points, Pastor, let me come to you for our final online comments, please. Um, here's a point um, somebody says, um, Caroline Archer, when we understand, when we, when we understand that serving others and caring for them is an act of worship, our mindset will change. Mm. Powerful thought. Yes. So, so, and come back to the idea, you see Muslims, Islam is a lifestyle, you know, it's, you know, it's a lifestyle. It's not, it's not something that we do when we want to do it. It's a part of who we are. When we understand the Sabbath in that, from that perspective, it makes a difference in how we keep the Sabbath. Mm -hmm. That is definitely coming through online. Nick B says, great point. At work doing devotion, if we have a visitor, we include them in the worship experience. We give the visitor a verse so that they feel included and appreciated. Mm -hmm. So a lifestyle, so people feel, they don't feel marginalized. They don't feel as if they're not a part of. Um, Sunson says, they were not evangelized. When we treat people as special, they'll want to know more about our faith. Yes. And that's the point. And the reason why Jesus was different from the scribes and the Pharisees, he treated people as people, yes. regardless of the day of the week. He cared for them. 
and, and he changed their lives. When you change people's lives, they understand what Sabbath is all about. Amen. Thank you so much, Pastor. As just before I hand over to Elder Valsi, let me just take our final takeaway points. Coming to you first of all, Sister Sasha. Sabbath is not meant to be a list of what not to do. Um, God doesn't wait until Sabbath before he grants us his blessings. So in the same way, we shouldn't wait until Sabbath before we do what is good. Three main reasons why we rest. We're designed to rest. Sabbath is a form of worship and Sabbath is meant to good, is meant for our good. Because mm -hmm. you remember that Sabbath was made for us. It was a gift to us, not the other way around. Amen. Thank you. And Dr. Burton. Oh, sorry, Sasha, I interrupted you. Go ahead. Right. I was just saying, Sabbath is a reminder that ultimately life depends not on our hard graft, but on God's provision and God's grace. Amen. Thank you. And Dr. Keith. Yes, and so the main takeaway has to do with the reality that Sabbath is about people. Sabbath is made for humans, but humans for the Sabbath. And there's a message in that for this COVID-19 era that we're in, especially for those who are looking for biblical guidance on what to do. And there are some folk who are you know, land into conspiracies, marketing, I think, no. What Sabbath tells us is that people matter. Yes. And as uh, we just buried my mother, um, a cousin died this week. Uh, Dr. Clayhorn from Northern Caribbean University just died yesterday morning, all of COVID. As Sabbath keepers, we should be at the forefront of the movement, ensuring that our fellow brothers and sisters are not exposed to, Jane, to, to, to danger. We should not be with those who are anti-mask and stuff like that, because people matter. Mm. And we should not want to be a part of those who are causing death to others. Mm. And so Sabbath reminds us that people matter, and there's a lesson also for COVID-19 in this year of the pandemic. Amen. Thank you. And Pastor Royce. Uh, well, Dr. Dr. Burton, you have, you have stolen my, my thunder, <laughs> but I'm going to endorse the point you're making about those of us who are making some very careless statements. Um, Foxtrot says it is essential for us to make sure we are passing down to the next generation our faith and living that full commitment to God week by week. So Sabbath is not just about Saturday. Sabbath keeping Christians are those of us who who worship God every day and care for people every single day. Mm -hmm. And it reflects, that was Christ's lifestyle. That was his lifestyle. Amen. Thank you. So Sabbath rest, holy rest, out of all the weak, the best, we have come to be blessed on this day of Sabbath rest. May this continue to be our desire. Next week, by God's grace, we move into longing for more. Special thanks to our panelists, our guest panelists. Thank you very much. And for yourselves online and in church for your comments. Thanks as ever to our AV team. And thanks especially to God for this time of study. And over to you, Elder Valsi. We thank you so much for joining us this morning and for participating in the Sabbath School. And when we started earlier, there were a few people, but now I can say Sabbath School is back to normal. So welcome and so thankful. Thank you very much for coming. Um, we have some visitors. I haven't seen some of you before. So welcome to Croydon Seventh-day Adventist Sabbath School and welcome to the house of the Lord. May you have a blessed day as we continue to worship him. Now, you have heard me twice, I stood up here and I was giving pastor a hard time, asking him for extended Sabbath school. Believe it or not, it has been granted. So this morning, he came to me and he has suggested, let me rephrase that, he has agreed to give us an extension. So I am asking you, those of you in the congregation, if you're willing to participate in what we call a Sabbath school day, please feel free to contact me or any of the Sabbath school team members. We have another one stand, sitting in the corner, Sister Claudia Gale and Sister Michaela Malcolm, and you may have their numbers and you have my number. Please feel free. We'll be looking for short testimonies. We'll be looking for any poem, or any song that is relevant to the lesson for that week. 
and we ask you to come to contact us and let us know what you're prepared to do. So we have from Sabbath morning to the divine service. Thank you, Pastor. You are very kind. Thank you. I don't, I don't think you had any choice anyway, so we thank you very much. Now, I just need to have some, give you some, share some announcements with you before we have our closing prayer. Those of you may be familiar, we have um, Bible Book Club in the week, the first and the last Thursday of every, the first and the last Tuesday and Thursday of every month. So it's being led, Sister Nicola Copeland is the leader for that department. I also um, lead out in the Thursday ones and she leads us in the Tuesday ones. So if you're interested, it comes up on all the adverts that's online. Please contact Sister Nicola Copeland if you're interested in joining our Bible Book Club. And mostly so for our newly baptized members, we want to get you on board, we want to get you involved. We don't want to lose touch with you. Feel free to join us, please. The first and the last Tuesday and Thursday of every month from 7 to 9 p.m. Now, those of you who are generous enough to continue to contribute your offerings to the Lord, um, I'm asking you please to remember that this quarter's 13th Sabbath offering will be going to part of the North American Division, and there are four projects who will be benefiting from that offering. So as you exit um, the church, Please, there is a, I think there's a, an offering box. You can drop your, Sabbath, your 13th Sabbath offering at the end of September. Um, because we are coming now to the end of quarter three, the third quarter of 2021 in our Sabbath school lesson. So please feel free to make a generous contribution to part of the um, North American division to help these four projects in that area. This afternoon, as you can see, the weather is not very warm. But we do not want to stay indoors. We are speaking about evangelism. So I'm asking you please to join us at Stratum Common, and we will be distributing leaflets to those who are in the common or those who may be passing by near the common. If you're familiar with the common, many of us have met there for Sabbath school study but because of the weather, we have to put it on hold. But we don't want to just stay indoors. So at 4 p.m., may I ask you please to join us at Stratum Common, and we are going to give leaflets out to the people who are in the park or those nearby, near the park. Okay. Now, may I ask that you continue to study your Sabbath school lesson and come next week, God willing, ready to contribute. So thank you so much, and may God continue to bless you and guide you and keep you safe as we go through another week. May this week give you courage. May it give you strength, confidence, patience, self-love, and inner peace. God bless you all. Let us pray. Father, we are so loved by you. You have blessed us with so many wonderful blessings. Thank you, dear God, for being with us and for keeping us safe. May your presence continue to dwell as we go through the rest of thy holy Sabbath, but not only today, but always, and help us to be a light and a blessing to others. For Christ's sake, amen. Thank you.